Um, our next speaker is uh, Jennifer Zerling. Uh, she uh, holds a master's degree in kinesiology and maintains a variety of national per personal training cert certifications. Uh, she's the director of our exercise and nutrition program in our Beverly Hills Center at Senegenics. Uh, Jennifer designs nutritional and exercise program for both new and existing patients. Uh, she is our editor-in-chief of the Senegenics Times newsletter. And with all of that, she's written a book on breaking the chains of obesity, 107 tools. So we're going to ask her to explain that and maybe give us the top 10. That'd be great. And most of all, Jennifer rocks. <laughs> now, he made me sound very important, but um, let me share with you guys really quickly. Last night at 4.30 p.m. when I was trying to get onto my plane, the guy said to me that the plane may not take off. So I didn't know if I was going to be here or not. And they said, you know what? We're going to get you there. But I had to spend six hours on a bus to be here this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and that's not a joke. <laughs> anyway, how many of you are cash-based practices? Okay, so this is a very important lecture for you guys. And it's, it's actually very important for everybody here. Because obviously, if you guys have patients, which you all have, and your patients are not motivated to do the work that you ask them to do, they don't get results. If they don't get results, they don't see the value in what you're doing with them. If they don't see the value, then they say peace out and they leave. And that's not a good thing. So patient retention is huge. But the number one thing that we must do is make sure that the patients are motivated and get back to the beginning point. So the goal of today is to go through how to motivate our patients. That's a huge thing. And a lot of times we don't learn how to do this because motivation is such an intangible thing. So I want to provide you guys with some motivation theories, which I'm not going to spend too much time on because you guys have been exposed to uh, the theorists that I'm going to be presenting. But what I really want to do, I just turned this off. Good job, Jay-Z. All right. I actually put together a motivation model of my own, which is more tangible, so that when you go back to your practices, you're capable of going back and referencing what I put together. So I call it the Jay-Z motivation model. I'm Jen Zerling, so not that much of rocket science right there, but very short and sweet and to the point. And to keep patient retention, that's the number one thing, okay? Because it's really hard to get a patient, but to keep a patient, in my opinion, is even harder. So we got to know what to do with them. So I used to manage five-star health clubs, and they would always talk about how important it was to exceed our members' expectations. So not meeting the expectations, but actually going a step above and beyond to exceed the expectations of even your patients so that they stay with you as their physician or their health coach. So there's two aspects to motivation. There's the intrinsic motivation and intrinsic, extrinsic motivation. You want your patients to be intrinsically motivated, okay? I don't know about you guys, but we have high net worth patients that come into our clinic. So if I say, hey, if you lose 10 pounds, you know, treat yourself to a massage, they look at me like I'm nuts. I get a massage every week. What are you talking about? Okay, so to have something external as their reward all the time isn't going to work. So we have to get them to a point of feeling that internal sense of motivation so that they ultimately want to do the work from the inside. So when they come to us, the number one thing that we say is, how do you feel? That's inside, right? Well, I, I feel horrible. I don't have my energy. I don't have my libido. I wake up in the morning. I don't want to go to work. I have 500 employees under me, and I just can't think straight. So these are all internal things that when you can correct that, which you will, when they behave, that's intrinsic motivation to continue on the journey of treatment. So some motivation theorists, we have Maslow's theory of motivation, Leon Festinger. These are just some theorists. There's theories all over the place. But at the end of the day, are we bridging the gap between the knowing and the doing? And that's what appears to be lacking at this point. So I'll breeze through all of these, um, and then we'll go to my model, which I think is very tangible. 
Maslow's theory of motivation, very basically, you have to get the physiological needs met before they feel safe. Uh, you know, obviously water, food, you don't have that, you don't survive. But at the end of the day, you want your patient to feel this way, a sense of self-actualization. So how do you actually fulfill all of these to get to the top? Very, very important. But again, we want to apply the theory and make it an actual tangible situation for each of them. Uh, Leon Festinger, this one's my favorite because I work a lot with patients who want to lose weight. So obviously there's always that internal battle with weight loss patients, which is why I wrote my book. You know, I, I, I understand the internal aspects because somebody who's been overweight their whole life, now they come to you as the doctor and says, hey, I want to lose the weight. They're still going to have that internal battle no matter what. Even when they lose all their weight, they're still going to have that internal battle. So it's understanding the aspects of this. So first, you know, they go to a, a, a party, which is the holiday season now, right? When you go to a party, you look at a piece of cake and, oh, carrot cake? I, I'm going to have that piece of cake because when I was a kid, I loved that cake. Oh, but I know that if I eat that cake, Jay-Z is going to get on my case or my physician is gonna get on my case, right? So there's that internal battle right there, and that's the cognitive dissonance that's existing in the patient's mind, and because I'm aware of this, I'm not gonna eat the cake. Now, do you think they're gonna have a lot of fun at that party? Nope. <laughs> right. they, they feel happy that they didn't do it, but they go through the party actually not feeling good about it, believe it or not, and this is something very important for you guys to know. Okay, now I come from a family chain of overweight individuals, and that's why I understand the psychology behind this. Um, and I'll get to my mother later on, but, you know, she went to a party where they had pizza and cake, and she's like, I brought my Greek yogurt. Aren't you proud of me? You know, like I'm supposed to, like, you know, do a cheerleading act or something for her. But, you know, that's, she felt a little bit deprived. Some people actually don't go to events because they don't want to be dealing with this. Is that a solution? So this is a cute little cartoon. You know, the dog is telling the boss, hey, you know what, let's knock some sense into the employees. Let's get them to really behave themselves. So really what he's saying is, I'm going to use some reverse psychology, telling them how, how, you know, you're smarter than your boss, you're underpaid. And the guy's like hearing that little argument in his mind and saying, I love my job, what are you talking about? And then he goes about saying, I'm going to continue doing a great job. So we should probably use that in uh, business, see how that works. B.F. Skinner, this is another great one, positive reinforcement. So this is very important because if, if a patient tells you, hey, I didn't eat that carrot cake, I am so proud of you. That is a huge step forward. If you don't acknowledge that, this is going to happen. Surprisingly, they want to tell their coach, hey, <laughs> this is what I did. And if you're not jumping for joy and doing cartwheels in your office, this is going to happen. They are going to extinct the behavior and say, well, my doctor doesn't even care. So what's the point of even doing this? I'm not losing a lot of weight. I mean, take someone who's 300 pounds, and ultimately, if they lose 25 pounds, they don't see a mark. But if they tell you, I didn't do this, aren't you proud of me? And you're like, oh, no, how nice. And that's the extent of the conversation. They're going to be like, you know what? I didn't really get that motivation from my, my doctor today. So they're going to go back to those bad behaviors. So negative reinforcement, hey, you know, I was at that party and I had a piece of carrot cake, but doc, I didn't eat all day. Well, I taught you to eat small frequent meals throughout the day and ultimately you didn't do that. You didn't eat before the party. Why not? So you're, you're criticizing. I don't really like the word criticize, but you're actually negatively reinforcing their statements. Whereas punishment, you're like, you know what, just get out of my office. I don't want you to be my patient. Should we do that? <laughs> I actually did that with a client two months ago. This girl's been training with me for three years. She canceled on me for like two weeks straight, okay? And here's a girl, she's very big in the fashion world. And I always, like, I'm like her therapist and her trainer, everything else. And she cancels at me through text at 12 o'clock at night. Now I use my cell phone for uh, my alarm. So when that lights up, the whole room lights up. And I'm like, I'm canceling again. I called her up and I said, you're no longer my client. So I punished her. She's coming back, actually, next week. <laughs> I said, but you know what? I'm going to be on your case. I don't want to see this again. She's like, I promise you I'm getting married. Hmm, urgency factor. Fraud, theory X. Okay, people are just lazy. It's true. 
people are just very lazy. So at the end of the day, they just don't want to do it. You know, and you got to tell your patients, hey, I can't want this more than you. <laughs> okay, I'll guide you, I'll give you every tool in the toolbox, but if you're not willing to reach into that toolbox on a daily basis, then what, what else do you need from me? Okay, so, and then there's the CBT. My mom and my sister are therapists in New York, and actually, they use this very effective, and actually, my motivation model aligns with this type of model, which is hands on skill set, follow ups, and all that jazz. Very, very important. But no matter the theory, can you guys guess who's who? I can't. But you know her! <laughs> you are their doctor. So no matter what the theory is, at the end of the day, no pressure. But your patients, they trust you. Okay, they come into your office and they're like ready to learn. They really are. Even if they do this, even if they're silent, they're there. Okay, so showing up to something should be evidence that they want something, they want to learn something. The fact that you guys are all here, you want to learn something, right? You know, they count on you. They don't have people in their lives to talk to a lot of times. I mean, some things that patients tell me, I'm like, wow, you know, they don't tell their wife this or their husband this. You know, they don't have that source. So you may be their only source in their entire life. They care about everything you have to say, so, you know, be very careful with what you say. And they need you, okay? I mean, I have a whole thing in practice. Do you need it or do you want it? Okay, because I want carrot cake, I do. But I don't need it nutritionally, okay? They want to be helped. They do want to be helped. They just don't know how to turn that motivation click on. And that's what you guys are here for. So they need to find their source of motivation. You're their catalyst. They may not have the answer walking out of the office that day, and that's why this motivation model is extremely important, because it's a dynamic process that goes on and on, sometimes for years. So this is my model. A flower. Well, why did she come up with a flower? Because she's a girl? No. Ultimately, I wanted to come up with something that you'll remember. And when I think of a flower, I think of all the petals kind of touching together. And a flower, the petals are very delicate. Okay, they, they reach up to the sun for light. You know, they get watered and it lives. Well, the petals, I want you to think of as your patients. Okay, your patients are touched by you and they live. Okay, you as their physician or health coach are the stem. You ground your patients. You teach your patients by giving them tools. You don't teach them, then these willow away and they die. And we see that all the time where patients will come in, and I work with a phenomenal physician, Dr. Lau, who's actually in the back. <laughs> um, he will tell them straight out, you know, you don't change, you will die. And you know what? That gives them the fire to be motivated right there. That's their urgency factor. So. This is what I want to go through, actually. There's four aspects of the model. There's the interview, visualize, plan, and follow up. But let's go through each detailed. You're going to interview your patients. How many of you interview your patients right now? Very, very, very good. OK, the interview is the most important part. Dr. Willicks always told us to ask the patient when they first come in, do you know what to expect from today's meeting? OK, so it's 6.45 in the morning. They don't have coffee in their system. And I ask, do you know what to expect for today? Because I'm all like ready to go. And they're like, oh, I have no idea. So it's really good to solidify the ground at that point by asking them that question. Because now you know where they're coming from. Do they even know what they signed up for? Because if they don't, there's your wow factor right there. You're going to blow them away. But also, what are your goals for being here? You might have your goals as their physician. But what are their goals? Okay, because if we just tell people what to do, do you like to be told what to do? No. When you get unsolicited advice from family, you're like, did I ask you? <laughs> it's the same thing when someone goes to their doctor. It's like, you've got to lose weight. Eat better. I mean, that's really what people are told all the time. But it's, it doesn't stick. It's not a tangible tool on how to. What have you tried before? Very important question, because you want to get a little bit of a history as to where they're coming from, so that ultimately you know where to go with them. Okay, and then what has worked for you? I used to work in medical weight loss, and they would tell me they tried Jenny Craig, they tried Weight Watchers, all these different brands, which can be good for some people, but it didn't work for them. I want to know why, or what did work. 
You know, while I liked the meetings of Weight Watchers every week, it kept me accountable. So perhaps you're integrating weekly meetings into your patient relationship. Okay, taking the elements of what worked and still using that if they feel like that worked for them. Very, very important versus what didn't work. I didn't like having to come in every single day. All right, well, we won't see you every single day, but maybe once a month. How does that sound? So the interview is back and forth. It's not just asking a question and getting an answer. It's a conversation. And how motivated are you to make these changes? Oh, in our health history form, there's a question. How motivated are you on a scale of 1 to 10 to make the changes in your lifestyle? And some patients will write an 8. So you know what I say as their fitness nutrition counselor? What's going to bring that 8 to a 10? That's part of the interview. Okay, because once you can dive into what's holding them back from giving those two extra numbers, a lot of information comes out. And then how coachable are you to receive feedback? Great example. We, had a, we had a, have had a couple of personal trainers. With This one guy's a bodybuilder who came in, and I'm thinking to myself, he's going to know everything. Like, he's going to think he knows everything, right? But he's no longer a bodybuilder but he still knows everything in his mind. So when I ask this question, I'm not just saying I'm the star of the show, you gotta listen to me. I'm actually saying with all the knowledge that you already have, which is awesome for me, how coachable are you right now so that we can do this together as a team? Okay, it's all in the way you word it so that they ultimately feel like you respect them and you know, you know where they're coming from. Very awesome question, what's your household situation like? You know, asking a guy, does your wife know that you're here? Some guys might say, no, but my girlfriend does. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, what, was your, what was your urgency factor? This actually is a great question because let's take my mother, for example, and she doesn't mind me talking about her, by the way, and I know I'm being videotaped, so she'll be seeing this anyway. Um, she had surgery 10 years ago, which she almost passed away from because it had complications. But to make a long story short, she actually, we were in Yankee Stadium about four months ago, five months ago, and we were going to the bathroom, and she's like, I'm going to use the handicap stall. You go over there, which was like down the hallway. And I said, why are you going here? She's like, because my knee hurts. I said, why does your knee hurt? She said, because they're having her carry all the books in school, and it wore her knee down. I'm like, no, mom, that's not why your knee hurts. Why does your knee hurt? And she said, because I'm overweight. So in that moment, it was that sticky point where you don't want to pick on mom because I love her more than anything in the world, but I want her to own the fact that her body's breaking down. I want her to say it so she could really embody it. So it took her getting to the hospital, laying on the bed in the OR, and she said, at that point, I will lose weight. I am not dealing with this because it reminded her from 10 years ago when she almost died. So now she's down 26 pounds, which is awesome. That's huge for her because she was always, you know, five pounds, eight pounds, and then she gained it back. 10 pounds, she gained it back. So you need an urgency factor. Asking your patients, what is that urgency factor? You don't need to know the answer right now. Can you tell me in a week? And then following up with them, which is key. What has held you back from getting to where you want to be? A lot of patients don't get their results quick enough. Okay, so when patients come into our clinic, I always say, give this at least six months to a year. I would even say in a year from now, you're going to be a completely different individual. And that's true. Okay, there's no quick fix, there's no magic pill. It's all about changing the psychology of how we do things in anything. Because if you're overweight most of your life, you don't even know what it feels like to be lean, right? Give it a year so that you could ultimately get behind the lifestyle and then the physiology is gonna all fall into place. And then go over the health history and reflect with the patient. That is super huge because if they fill out this huge document, you want to reflect on some of the things they wrote because they're like, are they even going to read this? It's like a book. So at the very end of this health history is the fitness nutrition section. And sometimes these people don't even fill it out. So you know what I do? I photocopy it and then I put a big question mark. And then I say, are you too cool for school to fill this out? And they look at me they're like, oh man, you know, I, I didn't know the answer. But then I'm able to walk through it with them which is awesome because now it's dynamic and it's building that relationship with the patient in that moment. And then are you aware 
I know in our clinic, Dr. Lal goes over every single lab value so that the patient is very educated on what is going on in their body. Because when you're looking at, you know, liver function and kidney function, all that stuff, they don't know what relates to what and how that affects them. You know, they don't just want to know their hormones. I mean, most of them just, you know, that's what they're there for. But when you educate them on all the levels and how that all impacts the physiology in the body, they walk away like, wow, that's exceeding their expectations because now they learn something extremely valuable. Does anyone know what MTFI stands for? No. Make them feel important. Okay, I have an 88-year-old grandmother who worked with physicians her whole life in a hospital. So when she walks in, she thinks she herself is a doctor. I'm not joking. I know so much about medicine. Okay, so when doctors talk to her about medications, she actually puts them down. Like, you're not going to kill me. I've been alive for 88 years because I know more than you'll ever know. Like, it's crazy. But she has some of the same physicians for, I think, 35 years, and they treat her like a goddess. She listens to every word they say because she feels important. Okay? Patients want to feel important these days. Let's move on. Visualize. Vis wouldn't it be nice if, okay, once you interview them and you get all your answers, going back to the next pedal, we want to visualize what life is going to look like if you incorporate the tools that we give you. So, for example, you woke up in the morning with the sexual drive to make love. Cool. Well, that'd be nice. You had the energy to work with your business model the same way you did in your 20s and 30s. Like, bridge it. Wouldn't it be nice if? Don't make it unrelated to what they asked for, because when you're interviewing them, you're actually taking all that information, and now you're creating a big, large painting. And ultimately, you want them to be like shaking their head like, yeah, I want that. Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. You have the body of a younger individual. We have a lot of guys that come in and their whole entire lives they've been fit and suddenly now they're in their you know, late 40s and they're like, what's this? You know, that's what aging is. <laughs> you know, your hormones are going down as we get older. You're, you're probably not eating the right way. But wouldn't it be nice if we can get you back? Well, yeah, that's why I'm here. Okay. Well, let's do that. Are you coachable? You are able to stain, sustain a more strenuous workout compared to people your own age. This is huge for our guys in Beverly Hills. I have uh, one guy, for example, and actually I have a picture of him, which I'll share with you after, but uh, he's huge into Krav Maga and lifting heavy and all that stuff. A lot of times you're going to have to step in and say, take a break, because <laughs> these guys get so much energy back, but your joints are still, you know, 47 years old. So you got to step back a notch and you're not 16 anymore. Okay. And they don't want to hear that, but you don't want them to be injured where they can't train at all. Okay. So at that point, once you create that visualization and they've bought into what you've visualized, because they might say, eh, that's not important when you're creating that visual, step back, interview them again. Okay, and then create a new visual. Again, it's a dynamic process. All right, then come up with a solid plan of action, but make sure it's interesting, dynamic, as well as measurable, because there's nothing worse than saying, hey, let's see you in a year, and uh, you're gonna feel better. Well, how do, I, how do you measure that, right? So teach them how, interesting. Every year we have an annual photo shoot, which is so exciting for the patients. Okay, we, if you, um, we have a newsletter that goes around, but we shared a couple of the photos. It's interesting because if we have a 70-year-old guy who joined the program eight months prior to our photo shoot, he has eight months to prepare to stand in front of a camera like this with his shirt off. <laughs> well, Jen, I didn't really plan on doing that. Oh, right, wouldn't that be cool if you were able to do that? Well, yeah. So now he's thinking about eight months from now, and I need to stay focused. Okay, it gives him a specific thing to do. Very dynamic is that photo shoot. Um, another dynamic aspect of the plan is actually perhaps introducing them to a personal trainer. You know, I used to manage personal trainers, so I actually still interview trainers nationwide. So if we have a patient from Kentucky, I'll call local facilities, I'll interview them, and if I like their credentials, I like what they have to say, and I give them a couple of examples. I never share the patient info. I'll basically say to the patient here, call them if you're interested, if not, you know, because you have to comply by HIPAA. But you want to get them involved in the journey because if they're just going through the motions, like some people will say, well, I go walking, that's exercise. How many of you consider walking exercise? <laughs> Good, thank you. <sighs> if you elevate your heart rate, perhaps, but not walking. 
Okay, and measurable is something specific. Great example. We had a guy come in three days ago. <clears throat> He's all about getting to like 10% body fat. That's what he always says. I'm going to get to 10% by Christmas. I'm like, all right, let's do it. So that was his goal, right? He came in uh, three days ago. He's now at 18.7%, down from 26%, but this is the second time he's measuring in at 18%. I'm like, what's going on? His wife is sick. Okay, it's been holding him back. And he's like, you know, I, I don't expect me to move that much. I've had a lot going on. And this is that positive reinforcement. Be very proud that you didn't go back up. This is huge. I am so proud of you. Yeah, but I'm not 10%. Yeah, but you know what? Most people, I would say 99% of the people who go through what you're going through, they revert back to old behaviors to comfort them and they gain a lot of fat back. So this is huge. So he walked out of the clinic saying, you know what? Yeah, I agree with that. And now he's still focused and now he's keeping a food journal, okay, which is awesome because he was keeping a food journal to get down so far. He said to me actually when we were done scanning him, he goes, you know what the one thing I changed that I stopped doing? I said... He's like, I'm not keeping a food journal for you. I have all my patients keep a food journal, which is so awesome. Try it because now it's hands-on, okay? It gives you contact all the time with your patient. And if you know about nutrition and you see candy bars and four glasses of wine, is that what we want for proper age management? Right. But it allows you to get involved every single day. But measurable, he's going to come back for Christmas. I want him down, I told him, to 16% by Christmas. So, Okay. So make sure the patient owns the plan. I'm going to power through this because I want to make sure we have enough time to cover all four aspects. Empower your patients to develop the plan because as, as long as they're involved, they're going to stay in tune with this because they want to make you proud. Believe it or not, they're like, oh, I'm going to see my doctor in a month. I got to get to the gym and really go all at it. Okay, so keep encouraging. Don't ever quit on your patient, ever. Um, can we play the audio for five seconds? Because this is a, an example of a patient. But keeping the food journal for you now. And how that works. Those days that go on a computer or get that to do I have, like, I'm like, You can shut her off. I just wanted to give you an example because I was on the phone with this woman for like a few minutes and I was like, oh, I got to capture this for the AM MG conference. Because that's an example of me interviewing, keeping a food journal is going to work. Yeah, not really. She's not into the plan. So if I expect that from her, which to this day, that was like about a month ago, it's never going to work with her. So I have to find other strategies to get into that patient's life so ultimately she gets the value and gets results. You see what I'm saying? Like you're constantly interviewing. And if, if you hear that, man, she's, there's a barrier up. Follow-up is the biggest thing. This one is huge. A lot of times we let the patient go. A year goes by, they quit the program. You never want to be without a phone call. Every month, touch your patient. How are you doing? You need a new interval program. You know, how's your nutrition? What can be better? When can I talk to you? You know, invite yourself to talk to them instead of just lifting up the phone or lift up the phone and follow up with an email. I left you a message. It's very important that I touch base with you. I have some great things I want to talk about. Not, hi, I just want to see how you are. I'm fine. You know, I, I want to talk to you about something exciting. Okay, I'll call my doctor back. What's exciting? What's exciting is, and then come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just have to improvise. <laughs> All right, interview the patient about the progress they've made. Has anyone noticed their progress? Sometimes people don't say anything. So maybe coming to the clinic is a great thing for you because now you notice. I mean, some of these guys walk in, we don't recognize them. They look that good. We're like, holy cows, th this is awesome. Well, yeah, you know, I'm feeling great, Doc. I'm feeling great, Jen. You know, what lifestyle changes have you made? You know, have them talk about their progress. Have them talk about themselves. Going back to the make them feel important. You're putting them on stage, which to reflect on what's working. And then they might even say what's not working. How do they feel about the changes? You feel like you own these changes? It's not that hard, right? Eh, it's, it could get challenging. Get back in that circuit. Keep a mind fresh because you want to jot that down so that you're following up later on things that they mention in their meeting. And revisit the effectiveness of the plan. Maintain it or develop a new plan. Sometimes people graduate. You know, let me actually, um, I'm going to skip this email because this is just a guy saying, um, you know, I gave him this whole uh, spiel on juicing. You know, you can eat this. He sees strawberries and that's all he sees. So strawberries and oranges count? You know, and I'm like, well, greens. We want greens too. <laughs> okay, so it, 
it goes on and on and on and on, but you want to see where they're at. This is one of my favorite stories. This guy has been on program for almost a year. Back in uh, November of 2011, not bad, right? He's 16.8% body fat. And uh, if you could play the audio really quickly, this is a great example of someone who's doing so great. What do you do next? Okay, that's him now. 4% body fat, 47 years old. So you're very athletic. Um, what does that mean for you? Like, this is just because I knew you guys were going to be listening on stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're awesome. So, but you know, it's it's him owning his own journey because he went to Bangkok to get Krav Maga certified. This is a business guy, okay? And he's like, you know, he writes in his food journal, joints are super duper duper sore. Sleep is affected because I'm so sore. I'm in so much pain. I'm like, you're not allowed to go to the gym for the next three days. So now in his food journal, Jay Z mandated not going to gym for three days. I'm dying here because he loves exercise, right? But it's still follow up. No matter how great your patients are, you know, you have the patients who need extra attention. But some people are like, you know, they're so in tune with their journey that every little thing you say forever and ever and ever, no matter how great they become, they still need you because there's so much more to achieve. And sometimes it becomes personal goals versus just medical goals. Okay, so really think outside the box with this. There's so much you can do. Track your patients, get an electronic medical record that allows you know you and your office to share notes so that if so and so talks with a patient, you could say, Oh my god, you know, I see that you basically, you know, started exercising again. Good job. How'd you know? Oh, because uh, Jen told me. You know, stuff like that. You know, keep notes of the conversations, like I said, have fun with your patients. You know, a little bit of personal disclosure will actually tighten up those bonds, set up uh, exciting goals for each patient. Hold each patient accountable. Use the Jay-Z motivation model. I, I hope we dove into that deep enough. I'm actually going to be in the expo if anyone has any questions. Uh, you know, we could talk about that with my book. But the biggest thing is to get the tools on how to keep these patients motivated. You can't climb inside their head. I tried that a few times. But what you can do is you can be there for them unconditionally, okay? And do not fear being in charge. If you don't know the answer to something, reach out to your colleagues. You have a lot of peers from this conference. Um, I know Senogenics has a wonderful program as well that um, is ongoing. So, you know, keep in touch with all of us, and uh, hopefully you learned something new today. So thank you for coming.